Okay, Jen doesn't need to hear the introduction. So I'm Rod Dobell. I'm in the absence of Oliver Schmidtke, the director of the Center for Global Studies. I get the honor and the pleasure of introducing Linda Sheehan. Uh, lots of you in the room already know her because she's been here for a while as a visiting research fellow. We're, um, we're very lucky that she's part of the first wave of the uh, fellowship program. She's been here with us for a few months. Uh, we have, I think, succeeded in persuading her to come back for a workshop or two. But um, she's here at the end of that uh, fellowship period for the moment, uh, I guess, is heading off very shortly uh, tomorrow uh, on a series of meetings, which will uh, include some uh, sessions at the UN, where she will be working on the topic of uh, the lecture today, the rights of nature, the rights of the river, the rights of nature, an interesting uh, development from some of the earlier discussion, which has been a long time talking about rights to nature and, um, and human uh, sovereignty and the questions of the way in which humans can behave responsibly in their, their utilization of nature. Uh, Linda, as you'll hear, has a, has a substantially uh, uh, larger uh, vision of all of this. She is currently the uh, executive director of the Earth Law Center working out of uh, California, previously has been uh, leading work in um, California Stream Keepers, and I think there's a, a large a, a number of other uh, initiatives that I won't try to uh, enumerate. Uh, she was working with the uh, Coast Keeper Alliance, ran the Pacific Region Office of the Ocean Conservancy, uh, where her attention was largely on marine issues. She's been working subsequently a great deal on, on uh, freshwater issues, and uh, we're going to hear uh, some of the results of her thinking on these issues. I guess, in fact, it's not any secret that what we're going to hear is is the uh, chapter outline of a book for which we shall all uh, wait anxiously. Uh, in this university context, more particularly in the context of the Center for Global Studies, I just, I, I've got the paper here because I needed to have it to remind me. Um, Linda took a Bachelor of Science in Chemical Engineering from my old alma mater, uh, MIT. Uh, she has a Master of Public Policy from the University of California at Berkeley. She has a JD from the University of California's uh, uh, Bolt Laws, Hall School of Law. And uh, she is currently also uh, teaching what I guess is the, the first of the courses in law schools on uh, rights of nature, I guess, at the Vermont Law School, which is going to be a course again this summer. So uh, she brings a lot of background to this discussion, and we're happy to welcome her. Thanks, Rob. And um, thanks, and, uh, thanks again for having me at the fellowship. It's been just a wonderful experience, and I'm not thinking about leaving later today. I'm just going to pretend that I'm going to be here for a really long time. Um, so as Rod was saying, you know, my experience has been for most of my career in advocating uh, laws that are on the books right now. Your traditional kind of command and control type of environmental laws. And after doing that for many years and, you know, doing as much as I could with it, I started to realize that we were starting to win battles but lose the war. And after doing a lot of reflection and research and thinking and banging my head against the wall, it started to come to me that it was not so much the laws and what we were doing as advocates, but it was the system that was the problem. So I started to think, well, you know, where is it that we want to go? And I think that that's part of the problem with the advocacy that we do nowadays um, as citizens, as environmental groups, and we don't really know what it is that we're working with. Um, and if we don't know that, we don't really know also where we want to go because we don't understand where we are. And so these are all sort of big philosophical questions that, that we all have about life. And I decided to try to wrestle with them in the context of my own work um, and my own passion for environmental issues. And so why I was here, as Rod mentioned, was to work on a book, which I'm also anxiously um, waiting to read. You know, just need to finish writing it first. Um, but the, the questions that I tried to grapple with 
in my own exploration of why the advocacy wasn't working and what is it that we could do better. Um, all of these questions really had to dig deep in a lot of the assumptions that we make as, as citizens, as residents, as people of planet Earth um, about why we're here and why we live here. And so just to give you a general quick overview of where I'd like to go today, and this is going to be um, a very quick run through the slides and I will give them to anybody who wants later. Just give me your email and I'm happy to pass them on to you. So just kick back and relax when I start hitting the, the forward button quickly. Um, so the question is, what I learned in public policy school is the first thing you have to ask is, what's the problem? And it's amazing how many times we forget to ask that when we're trying to solve a problem. But what's the problem? And then, you know, what are the criteria by which we are going to solve the problem? Which means, what is it we want? How do we know we're on the right path and when we've strayed? Um, and what is it, it, I'm going to assume, as you'll see, that what we want is to be prosperous, to flourish, to thrive, to have well-being. Um, and what does that mean uh, in terms of how we want to move forward? And then after that, looking at why we're not prosperous right now, really digging into what it is about the system that we live in that is making us feel unhappy in a way that we really can't quite put our finger on sometimes. And then how do we achieve this, this type of prosperity that we're talking about? And I'm going to suggest, um, just to get to the, the cut to the chase and get to the end first, that we need to be able to develop a rights of nature movement in order to start to build relationships with each other and the earth that will be healthy. Um, and that type of advocacy is going to be hard. So how are we going to do that? So what's the problem? I don't think I need to tell this crowd um, some of the problems that we're facing. Um, you know, we're seeing lot, many, many extinctions, more and more happening all the time, um, and this loss of biodiversity. Uh, is going to it's going to harm all of us, and I, I have a picture of this particular rabbit because it's a New England cottontail, and it is potentially endangered in my home state of Massachusetts. And it was very important because it was part of a series of children's stories when I was little, um, and it was you know a, a big part of why I came to do what I'm doing now. And to see that it's endangered is a real um, harbinger of problems to come. And part of the anxiety that, you know, I feel that a lot of us feel is that time, time is ticking. You know, with climate change, it's not that like we have all the time in the world to have this fabulous movement. It took 100 years, for example, for women to get the right to vote in a rights-based movement. And that was pretty straightforward. Do we have 100 years? I don't know. Um, it's pretty scary when the World Bank is the uh, voice of environmental reason. Mm -hmm. but, but they're saying that we may have a 4 degrees C increase by the 2060s, and that's going to take us into a realm that we've never seen before. We don't really know what's going to happen. And this is not prosperity. This is not well-being. And it's not just about what we do to the environment. It's what we're doing to ourselves. We can't, we have this idea that, you know, super, we can take action in the natural world, and it's not necessarily going to impact us. But we're seeing more and more that that's not the case. We're starting to build toxins in our bodies. Um, we're starting to see the elements of the basic elements of life, water and food, be privatized. And it's something that we actually have to pay more and more for. GMO seeds are something that people have to buy. And you can't, in some countries like in India, you can't store seeds. And so you have to buy these poison seeds that you have to put Roundup pesticides on. You're seeing this more and more because it's all driven by the system that we live within and not understanding that system. We may try to tweak things, but we're not going to solve the problem. So, so what is it we want? Again, you know, we have to ask what's the problem and how, if we're going to solve it, what are the criteria that we're going to use to know that we're on the right path, to nudge us back when we're starting to go astray. Um, and so we need to be able to develop criteria that really dig at what the assumptions are that we're making because I found personally, I, I can't speak for all of you, but I found personally that I was making assumptions without even knowing that I was making them. And a lot of environmental advocates, we do, this, we do the same thing. You assume that, oh well, you know, we have to have an economy and it has to grow and it always has to grow or else something bad will happen or else people will be upset and won't try to protect the environment. So we'll just go along with that and we'll have environmental laws that will say, yeah, the economy will keep growing, but we'll slow it down a little bit and protect the environment by doing X, Y, and Z. So you know, we need to be able, again, trying to figure out this criteria, trying to figure out what we want to make sure we stay on the right path. Say we want to be prosperous. Um, prosperous has this connotation today about economics and that economics is going to be able to save the world. Um, it's going to bring wealth, money to each of us, and that will make us happy. And that's what prosperity is. And we just kind of like assume prosperity comes with this idea of, of financial gain. But actually the root word of prosperity comes from um, old Latin that talks about this idea of hope. 
and there was an ancient Roman goddess, not one of the, the big name goddesses, but she was a goddess that referred to hope as a way of expressing our intimate connections with the earth. This idea of flourishing fields and flourishing gardens. And that's where this idea of prosperity came from, was this prosperity of the earth that was bringing us um, fruitfulness and well-being. And we've lost that. We've lost that context. This idea of prosperity has come to sort of a naked economic assumption. And we've lost that, and we've gotten this um, perspective where, you know, blowing up, you know, rigs in, in the Gulf of Mexico and killing people and devastating the, the ecosystem can be forgotten a year later um, and just swept under the rug. So what, again, you know, what have people said? And, and these, again, are all things that, you know, I'm, I've been wrestling with and I'm hoping that, you know, be able to share with you and hear with you later about your own sort of work and your own explorations. My explorations were with regard to this idea of prosperity and what does it mean. And philosophers, you know, this is something that people have been talking about for thousands of years. And I can't even begin to express, you know, that level of detail in a, in a quick presentation. But, but Aristotle was talking about this idea of flourishing, about human prosperity. Um, eudaimonia was something that you would achieve prosperity, this idea of well-being, if you were virtuous and you acted in a virtuous way, but wisely. So if you were courageous, that's a good thing, that's a virtue, but you, don't, you want to be wise about it. You don't want to so go, you know, jump into a fight without really knowing what's going on. So this idea of achieving prosperity through virtuous action, rather than you know, its opposite hedonism, you know, just sort of pleasure for pleasure's sake, um, was something that he explored, um, and the ancient Greek philosophers explored. And he talked about Aristotle talked about this idea of community, and that you need to be able to act virtuously and wisely with respect to the well-being of your larger community in order to be able to have this well-being for yourself. It's not just about you, it's about the relationships. And this idea of relationship, we're going to see more and more. And spiritual traditions talk about this idea of relationship and how you need to be able to care for others in order to be able to have your own level of well-being. And we've seen it in all spiritual traditions, the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Um, and this idea in Africa of Ubuntu, which is this concept of I am because you are. I exist and I am who I am because of the community and the people that I live with. And in, um, an Andean concept, indigenous people talk about Uiwa, which is this idea of reciprocal nurturance. I nurture the earth, the earth, the earth nurtures me. It's this sort of back and forth relationship. And the idea of karma too in Eastern religions is this idea that we have this sort of like, you know, faux idea of karma is something like, well, if I do something bad, then, you know, something bad's going to happen to me, or that karma will get him. But the idea is more about relationships. Because of the fact that we're all interrelated, it's a natural, a natural result that what I do is going to come back to me. You can't escape it because we're all part of the same woven net. So, you know, why aren't we prosperous now? Um, you know, this is probably about, you know, at least several courses worth of material. So I'm going to put it in one slide and then, you know, you can ask questions later. But, you know, we're at this point right now in our society where we're not feeling prosperous. You know, money is tight. You know, work is, work is hard to get. The environment seems to be getting more and more in trouble every day. Why is that? You know, what happened? And a lot of that is because relationships among people and the environment, among each of us and among between us and the environment, have been broken. And why have they been broken? And there's a lot of reasons why they've been broken. I'm just throwing out a couple. Um, one is this idea of Western science that arose out of the beginning of the 16th century or so, where Western scientists, Newton, Galileo, Descartes, you know, all these people who were geniuses in their own right, um, but they developed these ideas of physics and mathematics, and we got this sort of heady sense of optimism, like we can control the Earth, this is great. And the Earth is just something we need to break down into little chunks and understand, and then we could put it all back together and we'll sort of be, we'll be controllers, we'll be conquerors the way that we should be. Um, and so we had this hubris that we could control the Earth, but it created a further sense of separation because the Earth just became a machine for us to manipulate. And so science created that level of understanding, which is really a false sense of understanding. It created a lot of knowledge for us, but it wasn't something that we were able to put back together as we are able to do today with some modern science. Uh, another reason for these relationships being broken among people and the environment is the enclosure movement. Um, which went on for hundreds of years, particularly in England and elsewhere, where this idea of the commons was fenced off. And so people sharing land 
and taking from the forest so they could be self-sufficient, that was taken away from them. And so people who had land and were able to get a subsistence living suddenly had no land. And that fueled the Industrial Revolution, which started at the beginning of the 1800s, because these people had no land, and so they had to be able to go to work somewhere. Uh, the factories were fueled with people who were landless because of the commons. And a lot of times that, that not only created a separation from the commons, from this idea of living with the earth, but it created separation between people. Because you're not working in a community, you're working long, very long hours. Um, you rarely got to see people that you, know, you loved and cared for. So this idea of community was broken as well. And then the current um, economic system grew up around the beginning of the 1800s to be able to, in part, support this idea of the Industrial Revolution. And so we have this economic system now, which we'll talk about in a little more detail, which is, again, breaking, these separate, breaking the, the connections and creating separation. And separation, as we heard earlier, is going to drive us away from prosperity. Prosperity is about well-being and being in relationship with each other. Um, and I think that this is particularly, I mentioned economics, this is um, particularly apropos with respect to Adam Smith. And Adam Smith gets a lot of grief for being, you know, the father of modern economics and the invisible hand is, you know, the market is going to be able to bring all of us up and together and we're going to be able to um, be served by the, the free flow of goods. And he did, he did write a lot of those things, not all of them expressed quite the same way, and a lot of people forget that you know, Adam Smith was also part of this uh, philosophical school, the Scottish Enlightenment philosophers. And he, um, he wrote a lot about moral issues and virtuous issues, and much as much as Aristotle did, in the concept of community, in the context of the work that he did is important to remember, because he it was in communities. He was in smallish communities, not in the sort of global industrialized world that we live in right now. And to him, you know, sort of increasing profit for yourself at a gross rate is problematic because it's going to hurt the community. You're going to, you're going to be a pariah. And he actually wrote that countries where the profits are rising fastest are the ones that are going the fastest to ruin. Um, and he also said that the, the wise and virtuous person was the one who really put their community before themselves. And this is the Adam Smith that you know, our, our global economic system has kind of forgotten about. You know? But this is the same guy writing at the same time. And he, he wrote about this idea of happiness and prosperity is really about, again, coming back to this idea of relationship. And he said that the, the chief part of human happiness is from this idea of being loved by your, your family, by your friends, from your community. And this idea of happiness about community and relationships within your community was something that actually came down to the United States as this country was being developed. And in our Declaration of Independence in the States, we talk about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And again, it's not happiness chasing the almighty dollar. It's happiness chasing well-being of your community, making sure your community is healthy and whole, and in that case, not being threatened by you know, this, actually this global corporation which Britain was foisting upon the colonies at the time. So we, what we see today, you know, this question that we started with, why aren't we prosperous? You know, what is it? You know, we know things are bad, but why is it? And again, digging into the assumptions and trying to figure out why. And it's, it's kind of hard to read this graphic, but you probably know where it's going. You know, one, the 1% own most of it, and it's this tiny little gray dot um, down someplace in Texas where 40% would own that. And we're creating separation all the time. We're creating separation of us from the earth, we're creating separation from us for us from each other. So we're seeing how the, the rich are becoming the ultra-rich and the poor are just becoming more and more poor. And we're seeing this separation which is unstable. Relationships need to be working to be healthy in order to have a stable ecosystem and a stable, uh, a stable societal ecosystem as well. And we have our current neoliberal economic uh, faith-based precepts because none of them are true. But we believe them so intently we never question them. But it's important to call them out and say that these are things that are problematic and we need to fix these things in order to build our relationships. You know, infinite growth on a finite planet, you know, wealth concentrated in the hands of a few will trickle down <coughs> to the rest of us. Um, these types of precepts are things that we need to challenge and to be able to be successful as an advocate and to be successful in, in doing work to be able to protect the earth, protect each other. Uh, this is a photo that I took, I think it's just sort of, photos are so much better than words, um, at Rio, uh, at the UN Conference on Sustainable Development, Rio Plus 20 last year. Um, and this is a, a, at the People's Summit where uh, people were showing, depicting through street art and, uh, and performance, 
this idea of, um, especially in, in Latin American countries, African countries, Asian countries, where they're seeing these sort of global corporations coming in, and I don't know if you can read his apron, but it's sort of, you know, um, Burger King and Subway and McDonald's and all of these things, Kentucky Fried Chicken, all these global corporations coming in and destroying the land. And you can see sort of indigenous people and, and, um, uh, and animals and species being hurt by that and sort of the bad corporate fellow off in the corner. And this is a, this is a perspective that's lived every day in communities around the world that are being destroyed more and more by mines, by oil drilling, by things that they, you know, are destroying their communities and taking away their way of life. Something we saw with the enclosure movement in England and now we're seeing really globally as people are sort of just grasping at the last resources that we have. So, wow, this was all doom and gloom, and I'm depressed now. Um, so, w what is it we want? Yay, let's think about what it is that we want, right? So, prosperity that we want, and this is where I, you know, I, I, have, I have some difficulty with the way that we do advocacy, because a lot of it is, um, you know, we don't want that, we don't want that mine, we don't want that oil thing, you know, but what is it we do want? You know, what kind of society do we want? Because um, Thomas Kuhn um, wrote The Structure of Scientific Revolutions back in the early 70s, and it's a great book um, to be able to sort of look at how science changes in fundamental ways that scares the crap out of scientists, um, quantum physics being one example. Um, the Earth, you know, rotating around the sun is another. Um, and, and, but it happens, and so looking at that is instructive to think about how society changes, um, and to be able to envision what we want to be able to get there, you have to have something to replace it with. And so we need, if we want to change the system we have now, we need something to replace it with. And that was what Kuhn was writing about. And so prosperity, as we've been hearing, is this idea about relationship. And Aristotle and the Scottish philosophers, you know, they were thinking more about human communities. They weren't necessarily writing about the environment. But Aldo Leopold and other modern philosophers are talking, you know, sort of naturalists are talking more about how you have to extend that out. And Aldo Leopold wrote about the land ethic and this idea that you cannot be able to have an ethic of a healthy society unless you extend that to the land and recognize our love of the land, our inherent love of the land, and extend our love for each other to the love of the land. So if this idea of prosperity is about relationship. Um, and it's about ensuring that we have healthy relationships with each other and recognizing that the system that we have creates broken relationships and separates us further and further apart. Well, what kind of options do we do? What kind of advocacy do we do? As an advocate, you know, almost my whole career, I keep coming back to that question and I hear more and more from people, what do we need to do? So there's, you know, it, it inevitably there's always three choices. Um, and so the first choice is always the one we don't want and the last one is the one we do. So we'll just sort of run through them with that in mind. Um, the first one is stay the course, uh, keep doing what we're doing. Um, keep assuming that, you know, we can get infinite growth on a finite planet. Um, and that's, that's what our existing economic system wants us to do. Um, it's not this sort of, sort of evil overlord corporate entity sort of directing us. It's just a lot of assumptions that we make that we're not challenging, that we don't even realize we're making, but we can challenge them. Um, but what's going to happen if we stay the course and keep things going is more of the same. Um, more species extinctions, climate change accelerated further, um, you know, more hurricanes, more devastation like we saw with Hurricane Sandy, um, increasing wealth in the hands of the few. And this isn't prosperity, it's not even moral, um, it's just not right. And so, what is it? What should we do instead? Okay, option two. Um, we could redouble our efforts, and that's what a lot of advocates are doing. They say, well, we'll, we'll pass better laws, we'll get more money for enforcement, um, we'll get citizens more involved and give them more opportunities to weigh in. We'll um, get more green technology uh, and we'll be more efficient. And all of these things are good. All these things are good. Um, it's not like we shouldn't do any of those things. But if we do those things without challenging this larger, this larger juggernaut, really, of a worldview that is pushing us more and more towards a cliff, um, we're going to fail. It has to be something bigger than that. Because if we keep assuming that that's what we want, this is what we're going to get. We're going to get more water privatization. Water, the element of life, treat it as something that you can buy and sell on the market. And, as, and us assuming that that's a good thing and that will create efficiency and that will go to the, the highest and greatest use if we buy and sell it. Um, and that's where we're headed. So unless we challenge these types of assumptions, we, we will fail. And you know, I've been doing advocacy for a while and I can tell you we will fail. So, 
what I would say in, in all the alternative, in developing this world that we want, in developing ways to act that are different, is to change our vision. Uh, we've got a really limited vision. I was so happy to see this sign. Um, but we've got a really limited vision, and we need to be able to open ourselves to other ideas, no matter how, uh, how much they seem at odds with our current worldview. We need, we're, what we're doing right now is we're trying to change the levers, the levers of the system, how things work, sort of change the machinations of the system that we live within. But that's, that's not what we need to do. We need to look at the design. We need to look at the assumptions. We need to look at how the system is built to work. Um, and to be able to recognize, in particular, that the way the system is, is this, this idea of, you know, economics is something we all have to serve. We use these terms like natural resources and human resources. And that's what the natural world is. I mean, all of you work in environmental fields or, or, or you know, volunteer or have some activity with it. And to try to talk about it without saying natural resources is hard. I mean, we're captured by that type of language. And it colonizes our thinking. So we need to start to recognize that and change our language and change how we express. Because what, when we, what we do when we say that is we reinforce this idea that the, econo the economics is here, the economy is here, and that people are here, and the environment's here. And the environment serves people, which serves up into the economy. And that's what needs to keep running. But that's just false. I mean, it's literally false, because we're all, each of us, part of a larger planet. Um, so the planet really, you know, the ecosystems we live within comes first. We live within that, and the economy is just something we made up. The current economic system, the way that it's laid out, was developed in the early 1800s, since a couple hundred years ago. We can create something different, but we need to recognize environment, people, economics, and the economy needs to serve us. We are not fodder for the economy. So option three, um, and this uh, little picture here was one that I took at an elementary school in Beijing when I was there. And if you notice in the little corner, there's the sun where the kids always put the sun, except mm -hmm. it's not yellow, it's red. Um, every single photo, uh, every single picture in the window that the little kids had colored had a red sign, a red sun, because the sun there is consistently red because of the air pollution. That yellow sun is just not something, these are five-year-olds who are thinking the sun is red. Um, and that's not, that, that's not where we want to go. So what do we want, you know? And that's where we need to have a system, like Kuhn was saying, to replace the existing system, to get to redefine what prosperity is for us. We need to change the worldview, change the assumptions, stop messing with the levers, and say, say out loud, this is not what we want. We want something different. So we need to change the worldview from this idea that we got from sort of Western science that we can control, we're the controller, we're the or overlords. And really what we are is an Earth citizen. We're just citizens of the Earth. So change that. And this idea of sustainable development in the green economy, Michael McGonigal um, has this great way of saying that that's an adjective noun problem. The focus is on the economy. The focus is on development. And this idea of green and sustainable, they're just tangents. They're just something that you know, is thrown off to the side to be able to keep having development, to keep having economy. So what would we say instead if we were starting to decolonize the way that we think? We'd say something, you know, and there are many ways to express it, but you could say things like thriving communities, where the noun is the community, then the community is us and the environment, and the adjective is thriving, flourishing, that's what we want, and we want to build these relationships. Thriving relationships would be another way of expressing it. Um, gross domestic product is an economic term that we always look at to know whether our, we're doing well. You know, our GDP is up, hooray. Um, but that just measures everything. You know, if we're at war and we're selling lots of guns, then our GDP goes up, and how fabulous is that? Not very. So Bhutan has come up with this idea of gross national happiness, which is a, another way of expressing how well you're doing. And there are many people who have started to look at alternative measures of GDP as a way of expressing how society is doing overall, whether it's prosperous without just focusing on economic measures. Accounting systems that we have right now, if you look at the way that corporate books are written, accounting systems can be changed. Accounting systems can be made different um, to reflect the fact that the environment relationships that we have, the people relationships, are valuable and they're not discounted as costs. So how do we get there? Um, rights create relationship. And this idea of rights is something that we've only really started to challenge in the last couple of hundred years. We only had our first rights-based movement um, that I know of in the world back in the early 1800s, the abolitionist movement in Britain. Um, and here's a couple of women advocating for their right to vote. And the idea when you deny rights to an entity, you'd say you deny rights to women to vote, you're creating this exclusion, you're creating this separation, because then we can't exercise our voices in a democracy, we're silenced. 
And so the idea with rights of nature is to take, take that into effect and apply it to nature. And this idea that if nature doesn't have rights because it came up on the planet with the rest of us, then you know, we are creating this exclusion, this separation, and re reinforcing it. Nature is just something that is property for us to use. And so again, we're denying the fact that we're part of nature, that we came up together on the planet, we co-evolved together, and if we have rights because we came up on the planet, then so does nature. And relationship, as we heard, leads to prosperity. Um, and this idea about you know obligation, is, I think, is a really important one to express quickly, is the way that the Aristotle and the Scottish Enlightenment